let me start recording yeah okay the recording is on okay uh, any questions about what we have men- what i have mentioned so far yes will all these lectures be recorded and uploaded to carmen in the- uh, yes yes so the lectures will be recorded and they will be uploaded to youtube and i'll put the carmen link on uh, i'll put the youtube link or youtube playlist on carmen so the lectures are so all my lectures uh, for the courses that i have taught are already on youtube so 3050 this is the first time i'm teaching 3050 uh, in the last 3 years so uh, so yes i will be uploading the lectures to youtube and you will have access to it now and you know any time in the future if you want to refer back to these lectures okay so we are going to meet uh, monday wednesday friday 150 pm to 245 pm these are all online synchronous lectures uh, the office hours uh, my office hours are going to be friday 11:30 to 12:30 pm and we will be using the same zoom link that we are using for the class for the office hours and the ta office hours are going to be every thursday 4 to 5 pm now i am going to expect that most of you will ask uh, the homework questions from the ta on thur- in 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 his thursday office hours and you will come to me for concepts that are difficult to understand or things that you haven't understood in the what what has been covered in the class so far or other administrative questions or exam questions or something like that those are the questions that you will ask me on the friday office hour so i don't want my friday office hours to be just completely about homework and not about other things that we are discussing in the class so you can ask homework questions from the ta uh this is the core stack signals and systems as i've already mentioned the evaluation policy i guess this is the something that all of you are uh, very interested in knowing so there will be 10 homeworks one homework due every friday um that will comprise 40% of the grades four in class quizzes uh, 40% so the way we are i'm going to conduct quizzes is it will be in the in the final class of every month so whatever is the last friday of the month uh, i'll hold a, a in class quiz so i won't be there of course because there is no no classroom to go to so what i will do is the quiz will be uploaded on carmen and you will have to take the quiz online and you will get the grade or at the end of the quiz or probably like a few hours after the quiz is complete you will get the grades uploaded on carmen itself and then there will be one final exam which comprises 20% of the marks and i'll give you a take home uh, not a take home final i'll give you a practice exam before the final exam because there are no in class exams so before the final exam i do want to give you a practice test which i would not grade at all but it's just for practicing for the final exam uh, some of the assignments would involve coding in matlab so i'm going to assume that you are familiar with matlab if you are not you should probably start getting yourself familiar with matlab um any questions on the evaluation policy you can just unmute yourself and ask me any questions no so the homeworks are going to be pretty simple like just one or two questions every week uh, sometimes it could be a, a lot longer but most of the time i'm expecting it'll just be like a one or two questions based on the contents we have discussed in that particular week or in the week prior to that so that's what we'll do in the homeworks um uh, uh, one of the reasons why i'm having 10 homeworks rather than like five or six large homeworks is because uh in the previous semesters what we as faculty in ec department have noticed is that the students stop attending the lectures at certain point of time so i want to make sure that you have consistent incentive to attend all the lectures or at least you know go through the lectures even if you're not able to attend the in class lecture you can go through it later at whatever time is convenient to you but at least you should be up to date with whatever is happening in the class and not just you know do all the six lectures or 10 lectures in one day it's not very helpful and there are two instructional breaks uh feb 23 24 and march 31 and april 1 um so uh, just be aware that in those two 
instructional breaks there will be no classes or office hours uh, i guess i'll announce it before these breaks uh, are going to happen so i'll announce it again in the class uh, there's no spring break as such in this particular uh, semester due to the pandemic <clears throat> as far as homework is concerned you should probably i mean not you should probably you should work you should write your own answers and you should work on the homework as much as you can but you can you are free to take help from ta or myself or your uh, friends in order to complete the homework but it has to be written by you um, you know it uh, I, i don't expect you to copy anyone else's homework that would be a cause for a disciplinary action against you um <clears throat> the final exam currently scheduled on april 30 which is friday 4 to 5 45 pm uh at this point of time i can't really say how the final exam will be conducted uh in the previous semester i have had a take home exam where students get 24 hours they have to do the exam and then upload the solutions to carmen uh but i'm hopeful that this semester we'll have an in class final exam but i i don't know i really can't say much about how the final exam will be conducted at this point of time uh we'll discuss it when the time comes probably in april late april if you have registered for this course i'm assuming that all of you are meeting the prerequisites for this class uh, at least you should have some background in uh, the calculus in order to be able to understand the contents of this class some exposure to calculus and solution of ordinary differential equation and so on okay <clears throat> these are various topics that will be covered in the class um, starting from system modeling lti systems convolution fourier series a very important topic and uh, uh, design of filters sampling laplace transform z transform and feedback and stability Uh, one of the reasons why i'm including feedback and stability I, i'm not sure whether we'll get to feedback and stability or not but uh, i teach 3551 also on some occasions and their <clears throat> feedback and stability is one of the core concepts in those lectures i mean in 3551 which is feedback control systems okay rest of the stuff is uh, pretty routine um, and you can uh, take a look at it when when uh, when you find time to read through all the stuff uh make sure you you adhere to all the university rules regulations and policies uh, throughout the course okay any questions so far on the on this particular class any comments oh the in class quizzes one one thing i wanted to mention the in class quizzes will be last friday of every month oh probably i've already mentioned it yeah okay maybe i have already mentioned it so okay so pretty much every friday there is going to be something due throughout the semester so either it will be a homework or it will be a in class quiz so one of these two things will happen every friday okay so let's talk about the concept of signals and systems and in order to talk about signals um, let me first start with some history about signals and systems so in 1700s was the era of physics maybe until 1850s it was the era of electromagnetism can you turn off the mic if you are not speaking please thank you okay so 1700 was the era of physics 1850s was the era of electromagnetic magnetism and people were very much interested in knowing a lot about uh, uh 
uh, how electricity can be generated and how it can be used. That was also the era of uh, Edison and Tesla and so on. People who are, uh, or Maxwell, people who laid the foundation for electrical engineering. Okay, and then 1900s was the era of emergence of uh, the electric generation and adoption, then refrigeration system. So of course, the first thing that happened was electric generation and the use of light bulbs and so on. Then refrigeration system came, then communication system became widespread. Okay, and then it slowly and steadily it moved into transportation. So rockets and uh, ships and so on, where there was a combination of mechanical systems and electrical systems uh, that were needed in order to enable whatever mission was supposed to be completed by that particular system. Now, as you can see, what happens throughout the history of technology, there are some fundamental science that needs to be developed. Once that fundamental science develops, uh, a lot of new technologies get uh, generated out of that fundamental science. And then once those new technologies get adopted by the masses, then people have to optimize, improve upon the existing systems and so on and so forth. A lot of that has, has to happen in order for it to become cheap enough for, make, for making it accessible to everyone. Now, when you move from this very weird clunky technology to something that is extremely streamlined and does what it's supposed to do without any problem, uh, you need to have a fundamental understanding of how that system is behaving, right? So how are the signals being generated? How are they transformed? And what is the final output that comes out of that particular system? Okay, and whether that output is good or not, and if the output is not good, then you have to go back, redesign your system so that, um, so that the output is desirable, okay? <clears throat> so let's look at what exactly, uh, when I say a system, what exactly does it mean? And what exactly is a signal? So let's look at a very specific examples of systems. So you have a generator. The input signal is, um, you know, the rotational energy, which comes from, uh, uh, say, a water falling on the turbine blades or the air passing through turbine blades in the case of a wind generator. So there is some, some amount of rotational energy which gets generated due to some physical process. And the generator transforms that rotational energy or rotational signal into electrical signal. Okay, so this is a system which takes as input one signal and produces an output, which is another signal. Okay, so that's, so this is a system, this is a signal. Let me call it input signal. Let me change the color. And this is the output signal. Okay, so a system takes an input signal, converts it into an output signal, pretty simple. Let's look at another example. I have a motor which takes as input electric signal and it produces the output which is rotational energy. I shouldn't write, really say energy. I want to say something like a rotational signal. Maybe I should just write rotation signal. 
um, so something rotates okay that's what the output of a motor is okay so and that rotation could then be combined with a fan blade in order to move air through your air conditioning system or it could be combined with uh, something else to um, like a wheels on the car to propel the car forward and that's what the idea of a electric vehicle is where the electric signal gets converted into a movement of a vehicle actually i can write it here so now i can write electric vehicle let me just write e electric vehicle and that takes as input electric signal and it converts it into a forward motion that's what the sig that's what the system of electric vehicle does converts electricity into a motion uh, into motion another example is speaker which takes as input electric pulses which is also electric signal and it converts it into audio signal okay and you can have light bulb which converts electric signal into light and so on and so forth laser will convert electric signal into a laser signal and you know you have like lots of different examples now but it wasn't really clear in 18 let's say 1850s it wasn't really clear whether there are underlying governing principles that determines how are these systems going to behave based on the input signal and you know the desired output signal that we would like to have through these systems so it took us quite a while it took us i mean took the human race quite a while to go from individual systems which is a steam engine or, or a ship or a car or a, or a electric generator to go from these individual systems to understand that oh actually there is an underlying mathematical principle that drives all these systems and the underlying mathematical principles are actually pretty similar across these entire spectrum of different machines okay so so what's the underlying mathematical principle so you have and a differential equation that governs the input output behavior and so you give it an input signal and you get the corresponding corresponding output signal which is a function of what the differential equation that governs that particular system is okay so this was the uh, the biggest i would say the breakthrough of 1920s to 1950s where most of the stuff that we will be talking about well so individually the math was developed even before 1920s but to bring it to the area and be able to design very sophisticated systems out of it was actually done somewhere around 1900s to 1950s and that was also the time when communication system became very very popular and useful because of the wartime efforts during the world war 1 and world war 2 so uh, a lot of this uh, idea of signals and systems that we'll be talking about in this class were actually developed um, uh, in the context of system sciences it was developed around 1900s to 1950s and that's the era that we'll be covering in this particular class any questions on this history okay so let's talk about where exactly signal and systems fits within the ec curriculum that you are all enrolled in so if you look at the electrical and computer engineering as a field there are essentially three verticals in my mind there are three verticals the the smallest uh, uh, thing in every system is basically atoms, atoms and molecules. 
And so there is this whole area in the EC, sub area of EC department, which is nano electronics. Then photonics. Then microelectronics. And semiconductor devices. So this is the area where you start from very basic physical principles like Schrodinger equation or uh, some wave particle duality and things like that. You start from extremely elementary principles about how electrons move and how uh, waves behave. Start from there and you develop very individual, very small components that can do some something, right? And then these things then trickle down into power electronics, electric machines, and the biomedical devices. So you basically rearrange some of this photonics, nanoelectronics, microelectronics, and so on. You arrange them in certain manner so that they can do uh, something which is more useful and tangible, like um, you know, power electronics will come up with a circuit that could transform electric signals into rotational energy of certain kind, right? So those are the things that you study in power electronics, electric machines, and biomedical devices. So biomedical devices would, you know, let's say a, a MRI machine, it will create a magnetic field, and then it will disturb the magnetic field a little bit. It will look at how the brain responds or how the cell responds or the information that's coming from those cells, and then it will try to reconstruct those, um, you know, waves into something that is understandable by doctors and so on. And then once you're able to do this, then you want to improve the performance and do something, something that's much more higher level tasks. And so the fields that are um, important in this regard is optimization, control. So these are my areas, optimization and control. That's what I do. And then there is networking, communication, and then signal processing. Okay, so now uh, once you're able to do this individual component uh, uh, you can do, you can rearrange individual components to do something useful, then you want to build something on top of that, which can do a lot of other things, uh, improve the performance of the overall system, and, uh, uh, and, and basically, you know, build very, very complex systems out of those individual components, right? So that's, that, that are these fields. And as you move, you go from physics to mathematics. So in this, if you are in the nanoelectronics and photonics regime, you will have to learn a lot of physics. If you are in the optimization control or communication and signal processing regime, you have to learn a lot of math. And in the middle, you actually get to work with actual systems. And if you look at signals and systems, the signals and systems essentially helps you understand how to, how to carry out tasks within these two blocks or these two verticals. Okay, so if you want to come up with a new power electronic device, or you want to come up with a new electric machine, or you want to come up with a new biomedical devices, you need to have a solid understanding of signals and systems to be able to do that. On the other hand, once you have built power electronics, once you have built electric machines, once you have built biomedical devices, you want to rearrange them in a certain fashion so that you can build a very large generator, or you can build a very large chemical plant, or you can build a very large um, uh, oil extraction um, system, then you have to do optimization, control, networking, communication, and signal processing. And in all of these situ situations, you again have to 
figure out how the signals will enter the system, how it will get transformed, how to appropriately transform the signals and so on and so forth. So all in all, this is where signals and systems sits within the EC curriculum. And once you have taken this class, these are the different fields that you can potentially go into on the basis of whatever you are going to learn in this class. And one of the things that you will realize very quickly um, is if you were taking classes in these domains, you will have a lot of physics and uh, you know the associated maths that is required for understanding the physics. But when you are in this particular domain, in the signals and systems domain, there is the math becomes the underlying language. Physics is no longer required. So physics is required only to understand the input output behavior of the systems. But other than that, physics, chemistry, or biology is not that much involved because you have the differential equation that governs the overall system. What is needed is to have a mathematical uh, language so that you can talk about uh, how these systems should behave and what can you make change. So what sort of changes you can make in the system so that they behave, behave in an appropriate fashion. Um, so, so and, and that's what signal and systems is all about. It is basically learning a mathematical language to talk about uh, how the system should behave and what changes you can make in the system so that you get an appropriate output. Okay. So that's where signals and systems would help you in your um, future career. You have to have a very good understanding of signals and systems in order to be able to work in any of these disparate industries. Does that make sense? Any questions? I'm just going to pause here for a minute so that you can collect your thoughts and let me know if you have any questions. So in this class, will we be dealing primarily with electrical systems is the idea? So um, in the assignments, yes, primarily electrical systems. But in reality, like what we are going to discuss in class is independent of whether it's an electrical system or a mechanical system or a chemical system or a biological system. It doesn't matter as long as let me go back to this this part. So as long as you have the differential equation that governs the input output behavior, I don't care. So as soon as you have differential equation, it doesn't matter what kind of system that is, whether it's an electric or biological system. Uh, it's just a system, it's treated as a system. And there is an input signal, and then there is an output signal that is, and you want to make sure that you design the system in such a way that the output is desirable and not undesirable. So let me give you an example. Um, you know, you have insulin pumps. You know, my handwriting on board is so much better. I just don't know how to have a good handwriting on tablet. Insulin pump. The input signal, so actually I shouldn't write insulin pump. Insulin pump is a device. So I want to say uh, human body. And the input would be um, the insulin and the output would be the blood sugar level, right? So now this is a biological system. If you have an insulin pump, that's an electrical system or electromechanical system because there is some electronics and then there is some mechanics through which the insulin gets pumped into your bloodstream. Uh, so there is this, so the insulin pump needs to decide how much insulin to inject into the human body. Now the human body has its own differential equation that governs based on how much insulin was injected, what would the blood sugar level be, right? So the insulin pump needs to decide how much insulin to inject into the human body so that the blood sugar level is maintained at a specific level that is desirable. Uh, you know, I may be wrong, but I think it's uh, 90 milligram per DCL to 120 milligram per DCL. That's the optimal blood sugar level in a healthy person. And so if you're diabetic, you probably want to have, you want to pump enough insulin in the body so that your blood sugar is maintained at around this level. 
okay so uh, so so one of the things you have to re remember in this particular class is when we allude to system it could be any system it could be a mechanical it could be a electrical it could be a biomedical device or it could be just a biological system like a human body that's also a biological system okay hope that answers your question um so what you're saying is that in this class we're just going to be talking about um like abstracting away the yeah. changing signals like or like abstracting away the the actual physical system for in place of like differential equations and things like that yes yes okay, okay. that's that's a great way to put it that's exactly what we will do any okay. system will be abstracted away through a differential equation and then the goal is to figure out what is the input signal to this differential equation what does the output look like and that in so th this is what we will study so we have a differential equation we have an input signal what does the output looks like once we understand a lot of things about how this input and output gets so how the input gets transformed through this differential equation to the output how can we use it so the fact so the the part where how do we use this knowledge that we have gathered in the signals and systems uh, how do you use this knowledge will actually come from which area you subsequently go in so if you go in power electronics you will use the signals and system ideas for power electronics if you go to biomedical devices you will use the signals and systems ideas for biomedical systems so that depends on what you take after you have gone through the signal signal and systems class and of course i teach uh, 3551 which is control and i teach 5759 which is optimization so if you want to continue if you like this class a lot i would highly encourage you to look into controls and optimization as fields where you would like to potentially explore in your subsequent um ec curriculum so uh, can someone tell me how many so not someone uh, are most of you junior or in senior year so you can just write it in the chat window i just want to get a sense of how many juniors versus how many seniors are in the class okay i guess there is an equal mix of junior and senior students in the class okay great okay so there is an equal mix so i guess those who are senior probably this is your final semester and you will be graduating sometime soon but if you are in junior year uh, you can actually explore a lot more after you are done with signals and systems you can explore other areas and see which one uh, comes closer to your talent and skills which area comes closer to your talent and skills and your future uh, uh, future uh, what is that called career any other question okay let's talk about energy and power of a signal so in in the signals and systems class for all practical purposes um, the energy the power of a signal oh i probably should talk about discrete time and continuous time signal first okay so there are two types of signals discrete time signal and the continuous time signal okay so in discrete time signal the time is indexed as 1 2 3 4 and so on so t equals to 1 2 3 4 and so on or t equals to minus infinity minus 1 0 1 2 and so on all the way to infinity so this is known as a discrete time system where the time is discretized and typically discrete time systems would appear whenever you have a microprocessor because as you might have 
studied in your previous classes, whenever you have a microcontroller or a computer, they talk in bits and they talk according to the clock cycle. So even though in reality, everything is continuous time, in computers, everything becomes discrete time because of the way clocks are used to process information. So typically, if you're using computers, then there has to be a, it has to be a discrete time signal. On the other hand, you have continuous time signal where T equals to, T belongs to zero to infinity, sorry. Or T belongs to minus infinity to plus infinity. So this is closed interval zero, open interval infinity. This is open interval minus infinity to open interval minus uh, plus infinity. Okay, so this is a continuous time signal. Uh, most of the analog devices would use continuous time signal. A simple example of a continuous time signal is your electric current that comes to your house. It's a continuous time signal. It's not a discrete time signal. Okay. Now, when we talk about power of a signal, for historic reasons, typically the power of a signal is, oh, so we, we denote a signal as xt as the signal. So one thing that we will use the notation in this class, xn is a discrete time signal, xt is a continuous time signal, and the power of a signal will be xn square or x t square. So x is a function of time. So I want to write it here explicitly. x is a function of time. And when I write x t square, it means that the function evaluated at that particular time squared. So let's look at an example. My x t is sine omega t, omega is some real number. Okay, so this is my signal. And the power of a signal will be xt square or x square t, however you want to write it, which is sine square omega t. Okay, that's the power of a signal. And now if you want to look at the energy of a signal. How do you compute energy from power? Well, you actually integrate across time. Now integration in discrete time would be just summation, whereas integration in continuous time, you will actually have to integrate it. So this is summation of xn square, n equals minus infinity to infinity or whatever time bounds you have. Maybe I should write it as n equals to minus t2 to t1. If you look at the energy of a signal between this specific window of minus t2 to plus t1, if that is the window you are looking at, um, you, that's the energy, you basically add the power. Or it could be integral minus t2 to t1 x squared t dt. So if you sum the power, it becomes energy. If you integrate the power, if, if you're in a continuous time domain, you have to integrate the power and you get the energy of the signal. Any questions so far? I have a question. What yeah. would the uh, units of the original uh, XN be? Excellent question. Uh, so that depends on the context. So in the case of electrical signals, it will be either voltage or the current. So if it is voltage, then it will be in uh, uh, volts. Whereas if it is current, it will be in ampere. So the units will be in ampere. 
And when you do xt square, then correspondingly the power of the signal will be measured in whatever the unit square is. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah. Yeah. One of the so in reality, the power and energy which is defined in physics is quite different from the way we are defining it for signals in this case. So in physics, you know, the power is typically uh, uh, measured in watt and the energy is measured in joules or calories. Uh, but in that, but in the case of electrical systems, we are kind of cheating a little bit. So we look at some specific systems in the past where the power was defined as the signal square and the energy was defined as integral of the signal square. And then we just borrowed that terminology of power and energy without actually measuring it in terms of watts or joules or calories. So we are some sort of cheating right now. We are not really correct from the physics standpoint, but this is what people have been using. Uh, originally this power and energy was defined for radio waves and uh, there this relationship kind of holds with a multiplicative constant. So there's always a multiplicative constant, but power is proportional to signal square and energy is proportional to integral of signal square in the, in the radio waves and some electromagnetic uh, systems. Okay, now once you study the uh, power of a signal and energy of a signal, one thing you will realize very quickly is, well, what happens when I have a sine wave? Okay, so when it's a sine wave, the power is at sometimes the power is very high and at sometimes the power is very low and then again the power goes very high and the power goes very low so now the question is uh, what can i say about the average power of the system like average power of the signal so what you do is you actually divide it by um, the time to get the average power so you divide the energy by time this would be limit t goes to infinity minus t to capital t absolute value of xt square so the reason why i'm putting absolute value perhaps i should put it here as well is because sometimes the signals could be complex so it doesn't necessarily have to be a real signal it could be complex signal so i'll put a absolute value around it so that you have so that you have only uh, real numbers, not complex numbers. So I, I have put absolute value for signal. So what am I doing? So I have minus T to plus T XT square DT over 2T. This is the average power. Now, how do I do it for discrete time signal? I will do the same thing limit n goes to infinity summation n equals minus n to capital N Okay, any questions on the energy and average power? Okay. Let's talk about transformation of time. Okay, so if you have a signal xt, 
okay so this is a continuous time signal uh you can actually uh do some massaging to the signal so you can rescale the time axis and you can get another signal yt which is x alpha t plus beta so you have basically transformed the independent variable okay so one of the ways by which you transform the independent variable in the case of youtube uh, i think youtube has the setting where you can play you can increase the speed of the playback by like 1.25x or 1.5x or 2x uh, i remember that uh, some of the students for my optimization class they prepared for the final exams by running all my lectures at 2x speed okay so they actually transformed the time signal on youtube by explicitly changing the settings and so they were looking at my videos at 2x speed i i i really don't know how they can understand anything at 2x speed but they did for preparing for final exams so i don't know maybe something you can try by transforming the independent variable you can also do so that was x2t uh, with where you are basically playing back at 2x the speed this is on youtube uh, you can also do x minus t which is going back in time i wouldn't suggest you watch my lectures with going back in time because that <laughs> wouldn't make any sense uh, but that is sometimes it's useful okay uh, in some situations it will be useful <clears throat> uh well oh yeah actually if you are rewinding so you are uh, you know if you are playing amazon prime and you are rewinding a video you are actually going back in time so that's like uh you are basically transforming you are flipping the independent variable with a negative sign when you are rewinding rewinding on amazon prime you are going back in time thankfully they stop the audio when you are playing back otherwise it just would become very annoying okay so these are this is one way by which you transform the signal which is you transform the independent parameter over which the signal is defined so in all situation the independent parameter is the time um as far as this class is concerned the independent parameter is time and so you always try to you can one way to transform the signal is to transform the independent parameter itself okay you can do the same thing so this is for the continuous time you can do the same thing for discrete time the only thing you have to be worried about is uh, that that alpha and beta has to be such that it makes this this number still retain remains an integer and it doesn't become a real number right so alpha and beta has to be such alpha n plus beta is a integer is an integer or all n in z z is the integer the set of all integers okay any question so far all right let's study some types of signal oh i guess i'm well okay i'm close to the ending time so 245 is when i end 
Um, so I'm going to end the lecture today because I don't want to start a new topic and not go through it. So we'll start again on Monday, at, sorry, on Wednesday at 1.50 p.m. Uh, I'll, so one of the things I will let you guys know um, is after the class, you can ask me about assignment questions or about some clarification questions. I'll still hang around after the class is over. I'll stop the recording, but I'll still hang around uh, if you have any questions or before the class also, if you know I'm early, you can just ask me questions on the assignments or any other clarification questions you may want to ask. So there are three times when you can ask me questions, office hours before the class, after the class, and you can also send me another email if those times do not work for you. I can still have another meeting time to answer your question. So that's all for today. I'm going to upload the lectures uh, on YouTube and I'll upload the link on Carmen. So you will have access to all the lectures at one place. And uh, I'll stop the recording and I'll still hang around if you have any questions.